The following program is made possible by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, the next stage. After 24 years representing California, Senator Barbara Boxer is stepping down, touching off a scramble for her seat. One of those scrambling is Silicon Valley Republican Duff Sundheim, and he's here to talk about his campaign. The game is politics. The game is on. Welcome to the game. I'm Mark Simon, Silicon Valley Republican. Some say it's an endangered species, but that doesn't deter Duff Sundheim, attorney, former chair of the California Republican Party, and a candidate for the U.S. Senate seat being vacated by four-term incumbent Barbara Boxer. Duff, welcome back to the game. It's good hey, to Mark, see you again. See you. Tell us why you're running. Well, I've been doing a lot of work in underserved community. I'm a federal court approved mediator and I've been working on education reform in East San Jose. And I go to families' houses and I see moms taking out the macaroni and cheese and putting one scoop on their 13-year-old son's plate. And the kid looks at her like, hey, mom, I want everything in the bowl. I want everything in the cupboard. But she has to put it back in the refrigerator because that's his lunch the next day. I'm seeing closets being turned into bedrooms. I'm seeing people moving out of apartments into other people's garages. And this is at a time when we've seen one of the greatest accumulations of wealth in the history of civilization. We're suffering an economic earthquake in the state and in this nation. We have eight 8.9 million people in California alone living in poverty. There are more people living in poverty in California than there are people in 39 of the 50 states. So you see this tremendous divide occurring, and then the question is, can something be done about it? So working with Secretary Schultz, who's one of the co-chairs of my campaign, and other people that are smarter than I around the state, you know, I say I always like to be in a room where there are people smarter than I, and my wife says, well then, honey, you can go just about anywhere. <laughs> but there really is something we can do about this. And I honestly believe that we not only can recreate the middle class, but I think our best days can be ahead of us if we make the right policies and, in the, and if we unleash the potential of the American people. Now, that's interesting because, you know, we've seen nine Republican debates now for president, right. and they're not talking about income no. inequality. Only the Democrats are. Right. Um, and, and so, as a Republican, what, I guess the question, what are you doing? I mean, you're well, talking about something that Republicans don't tend to talk about. Well, I think, you know, what I see is that th there's, there's a new day coming. Right? I call it the new age of reason. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the 17th century, there was new science, there was new philosophy, and America then led the way in terms of political advance. Right now, we're seeing the disintegration of the old system. And so you're seeing people going far to the right, and Trump and everything that's happening there. You're seeing a person that wasn't even a member of the Democratic Party uh, until April, leading on the left side. And so people are kind of going to the corners. And I think what we need to focus on is what does the future lie? Not how we continue this left-right fight, but how do we move things forward? And what I'm here to talk about, and what I think the people are hungry to hear about, is how we can come together to work together as Americans to create a better future. So clearly, the message that the other Republicans are giving on the national level is um, not consistent with my message, but. I think we have a message that is the future, not only necessarily of the party, I really, that's not my major concern. I think we have a message that's in the best interest of the people of the state and the country. Well, we're going to get back to the, some of that in, in a few minutes, but I want to talk some practical politics, yeah. which is that the newest field poll shows you at three. Right. Um, the good news is you're at least somewhere because yeah. there's the other group that's others, and yeah. you're not in that group. Right. But yeah, um, I feel really good about it, that. It's a crowded field. There's seven Republicans right. that are considered. Um, running or, or in some, some fashion active candidates. Um, and I love the line in your last uh, campaign, campaign, you feel like Matt Damon in The Martian. Right. Uh, you know you're out there, but nobody else does. Right. Um, how, do you, how do you survive in a crowded field? Uh, how do you move up? Sure. I, I, well, I recognize that that's, I think it's something like 58% of Republicans haven't made their mind up yet. That's right. Um, so I would assume that's some measure of hope for you. Well, right. So the question is, uh, are, like the Martian example, right? I mean, he knows what he needs to do every day to get it back to Earth. And realistically, there is that path. I mean, is it an easy path? Absolutely not. But what are the criteria? From a political perspective, what's Matt Damon's equivalent in the political world? First is money, and we've raised 
more money than every other Republican combined. Uh, it's in terms of organization. We have the former chief technical officer of the Republican National Committee doing our social media. Uh, it's getting out there and doing events. We're going to be doing a border-to-border -border tour starting on Monday. It's getting endorsements of people like George Schultz, John Chambers of Cisco Systems, Charles Schwab is uh, supporting us, Kevin McCarthy, the majority leader. So we're going to be rolling uh, Ashley Schweringen, the mayor of Fresno, uh, General Lyon down in Orange County. So is can you put together the team and can you get the resources to get your message out? Mm -hmm. so, and there have been people that have been at our stage as late as April who have made it into the top two in November. So it's a, it's a big hill to climb, but we think of all the Republicans that were the best suited to take advantage of that. So the, p part of the complication is that it's all about June. It's about being one of the top two. May, actually, really, because that's when people start voting. That's right, because of the, uh, the vote by mail. Right. So, so, you know, with the top two mm -hmm. primary, the kind of primary California has now, in a state like California, where the Republican uh, Democrats outnumber the Republicans uh, almost one and a half, almost two to one, right. it, it's entirely possible that two Democrats would be the top two in November. So it isn't just appealing to Republicans, it's appealing, look, really in many ways, this whole thing was set up for a moderate candidate mm -hmm. such as yourself, who's going to appeal across party lines. What's your strategy there? Sure. Well, um, in June, um, it's, you know, the vote is very different than people realize. So for example, in 2014, in the controller's race, the vote was 48% for a Democrat, 46% for a Republican. And that was in 2014. Mm -hmm. This year, we have a competitive Republican primary. And we've done some statistical analysis, and there is a significant possibility that the Republican nominee will not be picked by the June primary. Yeah. Uh, there's a rule called 40B, which is going to have a major impact on how long it's going to take. People forget that Romney, who really had no other major opponent, didn't get the nomination until late May. Right. So we feel that we're going to have a very good turnout, so the Republicans are going to be there. And what the field poll that you mentioned showed that Loretta Sanchez's, her whole basis of the campaign was she was going to be able to get Republican votes. And the field polls showed that that's not going to happen. They're, they're, Republicans are going to be there, they're going to turn out, and then we've done some polling, and not on name identification, because Kamala Harris, some people know who Kamala Harris is, but when you go through what the issues are, you talk about sanctuary cities, you, thought, you talk about whether people that uh, break into homes and break into people's cars, whether they should be given a ticket or whether they should be going to jail, because she says they should only get a ticket. When you go through the issues, a majority of the independent voters align with us and not with Kamala Harris. So we do see a path there. Yeah. So you raise money. How do you get your message out? Because it's, it's such a vast state. Are you going to rely heavily on social media? How, yes. how are you going to get the word out? Right. And, you know, you mentioned that Martian ad, which you saw. I mean, yeah. that ended up being very popular. So on Facebook, you know, when you see ads and all that sort of stuff, they have what they call a click-through rate. How many people right. actually read? the ads, and the average is 2%. We're finding our message is reaching up to, we're getting click-through rates of up to 29%. Wow. So we're doing the, uh, social media is gonna be a big part of it. We're gonna be doing mailers, and we are buying those right now to make sure that we get our message out through the mail, and then we'll see where else it goes. But we think we're also gonna get, frankly, a lot of earned media, because I think we have an interesting story to tell. Do you, do you target just uh, Republicans or oh, no. everybody? Yeah, no, this is, a, so uh, for example. Uh, I'm sorry, I, yeah. we gotta take a break. Great. We'll come back to that question in a second. Stick around, we'll be right back. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo first opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. Over here is Duff Sundheim, the energetic Republican <laughs> candidate for the U.S. Senate. Uh, I was talking, we were talking about um, how the campaign works. 
and you were about to say something. Right. Well, you know, there are these typical silos, and people right. think that that's where you go. I mean, if we've learned anything, I did not see Trump, I did not see Sanders, but people want something different. They want something new. So you have to be thinking differently. So what we've done is we've just gone to every community in this state. So I go on to the college campuses. I've gone to 15 campuses so far, Cal, USC, UCLA. A third of the people that interview us has to become interns in our campaign. Mm -hmm. So the youth are really hungry for a new message. I went with the people of La Opinion, which is the largest Spanish language paper in the country. Mm -hmm. And after that meeting, they asked me to write an op-ed twice a month in their paper. So I think people that historically have not identified with somebody that had an R after their name are hungry because they're anxious and they're upset with the system as it is. They're anxious about their future and they're anxious about the education that their children are getting. Mm -hmm. So if you come to them and you, one, listen, and two, have a realistic plan, not just this kind of sop that they've been getting for the last two decades, which they see isn't taking them anywhere, I think you have a real chance to not only win their vote, but really more importantly, to make a difference in their lives. Yeah. We were talking off camera about that there's a large middle on a lot of these issues right. that don't, doesn't seem to get addressed. And I guess the primary process at the presidential level is about solidifying the base. Right. You know, the old saying, you run, you run to the right or the left right. if you, in the primaries and then you run back to the middle. Right. But what you're talking about really is that there's a middle ground on a lot of these things, that you don't have to be somebody who's against the minimum wage, for example. No. Um, and be a Republican, which that's not something you hear much. Well, right, but again, you know, people are focused so much on, and politics is so much of looking back, and you know, you watch football games. Well, the Browns haven't won in this stadium in the last 18 years. Well, they have a different coach and they have a different quarterback. You know, the, the rules are different in this state, and one of the things that you're seeing, we talked about, that this is an open primary, right? So Loretta Sanchez, the only reason she's running is that she thinks that she can win enough Republican votes to beat Kamala Harris in the first round. That's the whole basic basis of her campaign. But if you look at whether the open primary has been effective, we elected three Republican assembly people in LA County last time around. We elected three Asian women in Orange County last time. I mean, we are being, and these were people that are delivering the same message that I'm delivering today. Mm -hmm. So there is a hunger for a new way. You know, we've had some great leadership under Jerry Brown and Dianne Feinstein for a long time. But, and so I think, you know, that's people's perception that you can't win statewide um, if you're not a uh, Democrat. But I think it's really more you can't win if you're not Jerry Brown or Dianne Feinstein. If you have this type of message, I think you can be successful. So, so it's, you know, there is the hurdle of being red in a dramatically blue state. Yes. How blue is California? Do you think that there's, you know, how deep is that Democratic margin that they've got? There's also a substantial number of people who choose no party preference. In right. fact, it's beginning to rival the number of people who say they're Republican. Right. Well, I think what you see is a lot of people look at the national brand of the Republican Party and they say, I don't want anything to do with that. So especially on the social issues. So I'm pro-choice, I'm pro-gay rights, I'm pro-comprehensive immigration reform. But, you know, there, there are a lot of people that look at the Republican Party and say, well, those guys take the opposite position on all of those issues. So it is a hurdle. But I think that what we're finding in our meetings, and we're doing, I'm on the road six days a week, a real hunger for kind of common sense solutions to stop the, uh, the fighting back and forth. And there's a sense that there's developed a professional political class that puts their interests ahead of theirs. And two of the major people I'm running against are products of that political class. Kamala Harris, her mentor was Willie Brown, Loretta Sanchez, you know, similar situation down in Orange County. And I think people want somebody that's gonna put them first instead of their career. I've never held public office, as you well know. I'm a behind the scenes type of guy. Secretary Schultz was my role model. But you just see what the need is, and you see that there's this hunger for a different way, and that's what we're trying to provide. So, so while you're busy appealing to a yeah. cross section, yeah. Uh, how are you going to win Republicans who don't right. think you're really, you know, you're a rhino, you're a Republican in name right. only because you're pro-choice, because you're right. pro-gay rights? Right. Those are not popularly perceived as mainstream Republican positions. No. It, it 
With some people, but I think that's totally overvalued. Um, you Last time around, we had Ashley Schweringen was the uh, person that yeah. went into the fall as controller, did a great job, came very close. She holds similar views. Pete Peterson ran for Secretary of State, had similar views, and Neil Kashkari, and he had the most significant challenge with uh, Tim Donnelly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's this perception uh, based on what the national makeup of the Republican Party is, that there's a similar makeup here in California. Certainly there are people that hold those different views, um, but I think that really the mainstream Republicans and what we showed in 2014 and what we showed in those legislative races that I referenced shows that there are a lot of Republicans or people that are willing to vote for Republicans that hold these types of positions. The other classic red position is yeah. cut taxes, right. cut government. Right. What, are you mainstream there with the Republicans, or do you have a different view? Well, my view is that the deficit is a huge problem, but we have a deficit triangle, and the other two elements of that deficit triangle is a deficit in investments and a deficit in trade. So the way you cannot, by just simply raising taxes and cutting costs, you're not going to be able to solve the budget deficit. You're going to have to make major investments in education. You're going to have to make major investments in infrastructure. You're going to have to make major investments in research, which you know has you know the computer, the internet, all those. Where are those things going to come from in the future? And we have to get to the point where we're exporting goods to other parts of the world. So that's how I I would say it's yes. I'm focused on the deficit. It, but I think we need to make the investments in infrastructure and in technology to enable the people to achieve the dreams that they have. This is not just based on some growth potential. This is about how we make sure that the 300 million people of this country are productive. You know, people our age, I mean, alcoholism is up, drug addiction is up. People. <laughs> <laughs> however you want to do it. Suicides are up. They don't feel they're productive. Yeah. And we have to provide them a vision and a future for a more productive future. Yeah. We're going to take another break. Don't go away. And you stick around. We'll be oh, right okay. back. <laughs> It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo first opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. Over here is Duff Sundheim, who's running for the U.S. Senate. We tried off the air to talk him out of it, but he's, he hasn't come to his senses yet. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me ask you, we just had the ninth Republican debate. Um, what's going on with Trump, and wh what is your view of him and what he's doing to the Republican Party and the Republican brand? Well, I think we're seeing it on both sides. Um, it's an emotional reaction. We talked about people being upset. We talked about people being anxious. And um, as a mediator, you know, what you, you first learn is that, okay, the uh, people involved in the mediation are emotional. When you develop some wisdom, you realize you're just as emotional as the people that are involved in the uh, dispute. We're going through that emotional thing. So it's kind of like a fact-free zone on both sides, right? <laughs> I mean, you have Hillary and, and Bernie talking about universal health. I mean, just all sorts of, um, Chelsea saying stuff that just makes absolutely no sense at all. Um, you have uh, Trump proposing things that aren't going to happen, right? But there's an emotion. Real leadership is being able to take that emotion and put it into a constructive direction. And that's what uh, Franklin Roosevelt did so well. We have nothing to fear but fear itself, the emotion, and then he took it and he directed it in the proper direction. So the real question is, whether it's Trump or Sanders or Kasich or whoever, or Hillary, is being able to take that, those anxieties and those fears and turn them into something positive. And that's what leadership is all about, and we'll see where, how it emerges as part of this presidential process. If he gets the nomination, 
Does that do long-term damage to the Republican Party? You know, it's hard to say because, frankly, he's changed his position so much. Um, it's hard to say where it all is going to land or, you know, what happens, what does it do to the Democratic brand if you have somebody that wasn't even a member of your party until April. So um, this is a, I, you know, I'm, I take the Yogi Berra approach to politics. I'm reluctant to make predictions, especially about the future, <laughs> but no more so than this year. Yeah, but um, the, some of the rhetoric some of the very angry rhetoric, right. anti-Muslim rhetoric, right. anti-immigration right. re rhetoric, anti-Mexican rhetoric. Right. There are people who are comparing that to some of the things that Pete Wilson did with Prop 187 and how it runs the risk of alienating a whole generation of potential voters at some point or another. Oh, it's it's a real concern. I mean, you you can go back even farther. You look at the internment of the Japanese, uh, World War II, the Exclusion Act in the 1920s. Whenever people have felt under fear, they have uh, tried to find scapegoats. Mm -hmm. And that is going on. Um, one of my opponents in this race, Loretta Sanchez, said that up to 20% of all Muslims are terrorists. I mean, you know, where in the world does that come from? I mm -hmm. mean, she made fun of Native Americans and, you know, the war chant and all that sort of stuff. So when you have those times of anxieties, uh, times of anxiety, you do have that type of reaction. And real leaders get above that again and put it into a constructive manner. But it is a very real fear. You know, people say, well, things are bad in this country. They can't get worse. Yes, they can. They can get significantly worse, but again, I believe they can get better. Not only better, I think our best days can be ahead of us. Yeah. Why are you a Republican? You're pro-choice, you're pro-gay rights, you're not a hard-line conservative on tax cuts and spending cuts and getting government out of everybody's life. Right. Uh, why are you a Republican? Because um, I think that the Democrats are stuck with the special interests. If you look um, at what's going on with our educational system, I went up and I talked to the CTA. I asked to be interviewed, and they agreed to have an interview with me. And we were really getting along for the first 45 minutes, you know, talking about children, education, all that sort of stuff. And then they said, well, how do you feel about, uh, you know, us having control over the uh, agenda? Well, I go, no, I think that should be based with the parents and the administrators. Well, I lost it right there. So you have the special interest, whether it's the public employee unions as teachers or have control in the state of California. Also, nationally, they're stuck in the 1930s. They think federal programs are the solution. I don't think that the answers to our problems lie in some bureaucrat's office 3,000 miles away. I believe the answers lie in the hearts and the imagination of the American people. We need to build in accountability, but with the technology that we have on our phone alone, we can make sure that we're addressing the issues of those people that have historically been left out and why we gave Washington so much power. But again, I think they don't understand what's going on. They're not responsive. And I think you see it in the results of 8.9 million people in California living in poverty. Well, the flip side of that, though, is it's almost a cliche that, that the Democrats are in the control of, of special interests, largely unions. Right. Republicans are in the control of special interests, which are the wealthy, the banks, the corporations. Exactly. So w why wouldn't someone turn to see you and say, well, so, OK, let's assume you're right about the unions. Right. We're not going to we're not going to trust the corporations to there's, be there, looking out for our interests either. There is a bigger threat, if not a bigger threat, than the unions because the unions at least have the interests of the American people at heart, and corporations really have gotten to the point where they don't even have the best interests of America at heart in a lot of situations. I'm not saying they'd go out to. Uh, adversely affect the United States, but you know, they'll take their plants to China or Vietnam or wherever they can make the most money. So clearly we have to hold them accountable and we failed to do that. The fact that from that economic disaster, disaster of 2007, that nobody went to jail, is a travesty. The people at Volkswagen that did that stuff with the uh, exhaust, I mean, they should be punished. I mean, the guy, you know, gets fired and gets a nice severance package and he's off, you know, and he's left for everybody else to deal with this issue. There's a total lack of accountability on the corporate side. And when I'm in the United States Senate, I will bring that accountability back to the boardrooms as well as to the average American. We got about a minute left. Tell people why they should vote for you. 
I think if you're happy with the way things are, if you think that the professional political class is taking care of you today, then I would say vote for my opponents. If you want somebody that has a history of developing reforms, often historic reforms, that will make a real difference in your life, then I ask you to consider voting for me. And I promise you that when I'm in Washington, you will have a voice and I will be responsive to your needs and, and try to work with you to enable you to achieve the dream that you have for you and your family. What, what kind of reforms are you talking about? Well, I think we need to reform the education system. I think we need to change the community bank system. We need to change the tax code, all for these entrepreneurs and small businesses to be successful. And right now, your future, I mean, it, it, we hate to say this, but your future is dependent upon what zip code you grow up in, and I think that's wrong. I think every student should have the opportunity to get a quality education, and they can't do that in today's society. And when I'm in Washington, I'm gonna work to make sure that every student has the opportunity to succeed. Dustin Sondheim, thanks for being with us. Good. We're gonna cut out a little bit early, because if I ask another question, we'll run out of time. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's good to see you back on the show, and good luck in your campaign. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for joining us. With, uh, joining us. Join us next time on The Game.